intellectus sacrificium intellectus. The assumption that thought profits from the decay of the emotions, or even that it remains unaffected, is itself an expression of the process of stupefac stupefaction. The social division of labor recoils on man, however much it may expedite the task exacted from him. The faculties, having developed through interaction, atrophy once they are severed from each other. Nietzsche's aphorism that the degree and kind of a man's sexuality extends to the highest pinnacle of his spirit has a more than merely psychological application, because even its remotest objectifications are nourished by impulses, thought destroys in the latter the condition of its own existence. Is not memory inseparable from, from love, which seeks to preserve what yet must pass away? Is not each stirring of fantasy engendered by desire, which, in displacing the elements of what exists, transcends it without betrayal? Is, indeed, is not indeed the simplest perception shaped by fear of the thing perceived, or desire for it? It is true that the objective meaning of knowledge has, with the objectification of the world, become progressively detached from the underlying impulses. It is equally true that knowledge breaks down where its effort of objectification remains under the sway of desire. But if the impulses are not at once preserved and surpassed in the thought which has escaped their sway, then there will be no knowledge at all, and the thought that murders the wish that fathered it will be overtaken by the revenge of stupidity. Memory is tabooed as unpredictable, unreliable, irrational. The resulting intellectual asthma, which culminates in the dissolution of the historical dimension of consciousness, leads directly to a depreciation of the synthetic apperception, which, according to Kant, cannot be divorced from reproduction in imagination, from recollection. Fantasy alone, today consigned to the realm of the unconscious and prescribed from knowledge as a childish, injudicious rudiment, can establish that relation between objects, which is the irrevocable source of all judgment. Should fantasy be driven out, judgment too, the real act of knowledge, is exercised. But the castration of perception by a court of control that denies it any anticipatory desire forces it thereby into a pattern of helplessly reiterating what is already known. When nothing more may actually be seen, the intellect is sacrificed. Just as, under the primacy of the autonomous production process, the purpose of reason dwindles away until it sinks into the fetish fetishism of itself and of external power, so reason itself is reduced to an instrument and assimilated to its functionaries, whose power of thought serves only the purpose of preventing thought. Once the last trace of emotion has been eradicated, nothing remains of thought but absolute tautology. The utterly pure reason of those who have divested themselves entirely of the ability to conceive of an object, even in its absence, converges with pure unconsciousness, with feeble-mindedness in the most literal sense, for measured against the extravagantly realistic ideal of a datum freed of any categories, all knowledge is false, and true only where the question of truth or falsity cannot be applied. That such tendencies are far advanced can be seen at every turn in the activities of science, which is on the point of bringing the last remnants of the world, defenseless ruins, under its yoke.